Welcome to our class on Chassidus. This week we'll be learning a Chassidic discourse of the Rebbe that the Rebbe said in Shabbos, Pashas, Matois, and Masai, which was Mavorchim, the Chodesh, Menachemov, in the year Tavshin, Chavtes, which was 51 years ago. It's based on several verses in this week's Torah portion when it speaks about the tribe of Ruvain and the tribe of God, where the Torah says, and I'll quote the verse, Umikne Rav, Hoyil of Ne Ruvain of Ne God, that for the tribe of Ruvain and the tribe of God, they had a lot of cattle. And as the verse says, Atsumoid, tremendous amounts of cattle. And they would graze the cattle out in the fields. And the Torah tells us, This was a place which was great to be able to take care of a lot, a lot of sheep. So they turned to Moshe and they said, And they said, If we find favor in your eyes, you Give your servants this land as an inheritance. Everyone's going to have an inheritance in the land of Israel. Give us on this side of the Jordan. Al Tavarenu Sayyadin do not take us over the Jordan into the land of Israel. We're willing to stay here. So the Rebbe Maharash, in a Hasidic discourse, which was 100 years before the Rebbe said this discourse, in uh, Tavshin Chavtes, so it was in Tav Reish Chavtes, so obviously it's 100 years from when the Rebbe said it, and it's, today it would be 151 years. So in this Hasidic discourse, the Rebbe Maharash says, what was it that motivated and it was behind the idea that Bnei Rovain and Bnei God did not want to go over to the Jordan. Everybody wants to go into the land of Israel. They were willing to sacrifice that so that their cattle should have a place um, to eat and to feed them. What, what was the real reason? So the Rebbe Marash explains, based on a Hasidic discourse of the Alter Rebbe, where the Alter Rebbe explains the difference between Yosef at Tzaddik and all the other tribes. What was the difference? So we know that the tribes, they just wanted to take care of sheep. They did not want to be involved with worldly ideas. They didn't want to involve, be involved with business. They didn't want to be involved with people. They just wanted to live a spiritual life. Now, why is that? Because their goal was to cleave to Hashem. They wanted to be one with Hashem. They felt like that if they got involved with business and with people and with industries and uh, politics, etc., that would take away from them cleaving to Hashem. So they picked for themselves a life. They had cattle. They took care of it. That's how they fed their families. That's how, that's how, they, that's how they were able to support, support themselves without having to be, be involved in this physical world and whatever the world resembles. That was who? The tribes. Yosef, on the other hand, we know, Yosef was totally involved in the business world. He ran the country of Egypt. He was a, he was a great leader. Nevertheless, even though he was involved in business and he was a great leader, he still cleaved to God 100%. And as the Rebbe says, we know that the, all the tribes, all the tribes, Yosef and all the tribes, they were all holy, each in their own way. Because it says by Yaakov with me, Tate Shlema. So obviously, they, there, it wasn't like one was right and one was wrong. Yosef was right in his approach. The tribes were right in their approach. But the question is, how does that work? They're both right? Now, obviously, there's a reason why each one is right and was right for that person. So it was right for Yosef, was right for Yosef, but obviously not for the tribes. And was right for the tribes, was right for the tribes, and obviously not for Yosef at Tzaddik. What is the reason for it? So the, Rebbe, so the altar explains, and the, obviously the Rebbe quotes it from the Rebbe Marash, that says as follows, that... The source, everyone in this world, we come from somewhere. Everyone has a shayrish, we have a root. So the Atreba says the shayrish, the root for the 12 tribes, excluding Yosef, was from a spiritual level called Yud Beis Bakar de Bia. 12 cattle of the world of Bia stands for Bria Yitzira Asiya which Bria, Yitzira, Asiya, what do they all have in common? That is the world where it's Pirut, where it's not necessarily one, where the only thing you see is God and godliness. There's already a Bria, creation, something else exists, Yitzira, formation, and obviously in the world of Asiya, there's a physical world. So what they have in common, Bia, Bria, Yitzira, Asiya, it's the world of separation on some level from God and godliness. 
even though the truth is nothing's really separate from God. But what it looks like, there's a separation. Now, since the tribes, their source, their service was from Yud Beis Bakr of the Biyah, which is basically a place that the source is, there's an illusion of a separation and disconnect from God. So they were concerned that since they were prone because of their source, if they got involved in the world, they would be disconnected from Hashem. And they did not want to be disconnected from Hashem. So because they didn't want to be disconnected from Hashem, they chose to be taking care of the sheep, and this way they would be like in a safe zone and they wouldn't be distracted from the world. So that applies to who? To the tribes. On the other hand, what was the shoyrish of Yosef? So we all know Yosef was called Tzadik el a high level of a, tzad- of a tzaddik. And his shayrish was the world of Atzilut. What is the world of Atzilut? The world of Atzilut, we know it comes from Eitzel, it's right next to Hashem, where everything is unified. In the world of Atzilut, the only thing you see, physically, spiritually, even in the illusion, it's only Hashem. You only see, not only the part of Hashem, you see the Achtos Hashem, that it's really all about Hashem. As the Zohar says in reference to the world of Atzilut, and I'll quote it in Hebrew and I'll translate it, or in Aramaic, Ihu v'chayehu chad, Ihu v'garmeo chad, that means the light and the vessel, where usually the vessel is distinct from the light, it's all one. In the world of Atzilut, it's all one. So on the level of Atzilus, where Yosef Shurish was, there's no difference. Physical, spiritual, business, leadership, people, sheep, there's no distraction. It's all one. So therefore, Yosef didn't have an issue with being involved in the world, because the world wouldn't distract from him, as his source was the world of Atzilus. So based on this, the, uh, the, uh, based on this difference that the altar explains the difference between Yosef, that he was from the source of oneness, and therefore he had no issue with being involved in the world, and the tribes were the source from Yud Beis, Bakr, the Biyah, therefore they had an issue with being involved in the world. So based on this, the Rebbe Marash explains, you know why? The tribe of God and the tribe of Ruvain wanted to stay on the other side of the Jordan was because they wanted to be in a place of cattle, because they didn't want to be distracted from Hashem. They wanted to cleave to Hashem, and they felt like had they crossed over the Jordan and had to deal with world, that would take away from the distraction with Hashem. That is the first piece in this Chassidic Discourse, where the Rebbe quotes a uh, Chassidic Discourse from the Rebbe Marash, who explains the idea based on um, the teaching of the Alter Rebbe. So here in the second chapter, the Rebbe asks a simple question. Beautiful explanation. It's great. However, the Rebbe Marash does not explain the difference why, if that's the case, that the Bnei God, the Bnei Ruvain, wanted to stay on one side of the Jordan so they can stay connected to Hashem, and they won't have to be involved in Eretz Yisrael and with, the world, with, with worldly things, God forbid they would get disconnected. So how come the tribes did want to cross the Jordan and go to Eretz Yisrael? That's the question the Rebbe asks. So the Rebbe explains this based on a Midrash. The Midrash says like this, that since God and Ruvain, knows the children of God and the children of Ruvain, the tribe of God and the tribe of Ruvain, they were very, very careful when they pastured the sheep, they would not steal. They only took them to a place that belonged to them or a place that was ownerless that belonged to everybody. So therefore, because they were so careful not to steal, so Hashem gave them an inheritance, a place where they will have the opportunity to be able to take care of the sheep without stealing. And that's why the verse said, how do they refer to the place on the, on the side of the Jordan where they were, where they wanted to keep it? Which means it was a place to graze the sheep. And because they were careful not stealing, therefore Hashem gave them that place as a gift. Again, to underscore that there was something unique and something special and different about the tribe of God and Ruvain, that they were very, very careful not to, God forbid, steal, and that's why they received a place on, the, on that side of the Jordan. That is one measure. Now, what does that mean on a spiritual level? They were careful not to steal. So on a spiritual level, we know there's something which is called, we have a spiritual avoid in this world, which is called avoidas habirun. Our job in this world is 
avoido, it's work, spiritual work, to me mavarer, which means in this physical world that we're in, so it looks like it's a physical world, but the tr- reality is, why are we in this physical world? Because in this physical world, whether it's in uh, food, whether it's in drink, whether it's in places, there's holy sparks. Our avoida in this world is to elevate those holy sparks. So that's why, for example, when you sit down to eat or when you want to take a drink, you make a blessing beforehand. Why? Because there's a holy spark that's in there that needs that blessing to be elevated. Or, for example, as the Baal Shem Tov says, when you come to a place, anywhere you are, you're traveling, say a Dvar Torah, share a Torah thought, uh, discuss an idea in Torah. Why? Because the place wants, wants to and needs to be elevated. And by you doing something holy and spiritual, you're actually elevating the place that you're in. So, therefore, the, a job of avoidance of Berurim on a spiritual level, if you think about it, it's like really stealing. Why? Because the place is, is there. It's doing its thing. The food is doing its thing. The drink is doing its thing. What are you coming along? And you're yanking out the godly spirit, which is a spiritual form of stealing. You're pulling out the godly spirit. So in other words, just like on a spiritual level that the... Um, but they got in roof and wanted to stay on one side of the room because they don't want to steal anything physical. They want the same thing also on a spiritual level. They didn't want to be busy in the land of Israel without void of Birurim to having to steal these holy sparks. They just wanted to live a beautiful, simple, peaceful life. And which is interesting is the Rebbe brings the famous story where which is another Medrash, that um, Medrash says that when Yaakov met Esav, and we know that they were our, they, Esau wanted to kill Yaakov. So Yaakov says, hey, to relax. There's two worlds. There is the Olam Haza, the physical world, with pleasure, enjoyment, materialism. And there's Olam Haba, the spiritual world. Let's make a deal. You take the whole physical world, you take Olam Haza, and everything associated with materialism, and I'll take Olam Haba. So Esau said, voila, we have a deal. Wonderful. And they actually agreed. Olam Haba is going to belong to Yaakov, and Olam Haza is going to belong to Esav. What happened? Esav went to Laban. We all know he got married, two wives, two concubines, he had the tribes there, and he became very, very wealthy. He's traveling back on his journey, and Esav meets him. He, and Isa sees that Yaakov is there with his wives, with his children, and with all the wealth, the cattle, and the jewelry, and all the tremendous wealth that he had. So Esau says to Yaakov, what's this? We made up that the physical world is mine. The spiritual world is yours. What are you doing with all these things? In other words, you're stealing. Obviously, Yaakov wasn't looking for the physical of the physical part. He was looking to elevate the holy sparks in the physical world. The physical world, sure, Esau can have. But the holy, he was going after the Olam Haba that was buried in this world. But nevertheless, you see that when you do the avoid the avoid of Urim, as we see in the case of Yaakov and Esau, it's called stealing. And the proof is that Esau called him out on it. So because of that, B'nai God and Reuven did not want to go into the land of Israel. Because they didn't want to be involved in stealing any sparks. They just wanted, leave me alone, I'll live a spiritual life without having to elevate, etc. Now, so from the Medrash, it seems, from the Medrash, it seems, the fact that they wanted to stay on the side of the Jordan without crossing over because they didn't want to steal, obviously on a physical level, it's a great thing. It's a nice compliment. They did not want to steal, and that's why they got that as a gift. However, there's another Medrash. The other Medrash says that, unfortunately, look at this. The Bnei God and Bnei Reuven, they took the main thing and they made it secondary. And they took the secondary and made it the main thing. Why? Because look what they did. Here you have the whole Jewish people going to the Holy Land of Israel, which is much holier than the land on the other side of the Jordan. And here, look what they did. They took the main thing, Israel, and they gave it away for their money. They made their money the main thing, and they gave away the spirituality. In other words, they loved physical things more than the spirit. So the Medrash is saying, obviously, something negative which actually goes in line with the spiritual understanding of the first Medrash. Because according to the first Medrash, 
If you look at simply that they didn't want to steal, okay, it was, it, was a, it was a compliment to them. But if you look at the spiritual significance, they didn't want to steal baruchnis, that means they didn't want to elevate the sparks. It's a negative thing, which is in line with the other medrash that they did not cross over. And it says, look, you made the, you made the main thing, the secondary thing. You focused more on the money versus on um, the, spir- the spirituality of life. Now, <clears throat> okay, so that is basically the idea why Bnei Gad and Rey Ruvain, Dafka, specifically wanted to stay on one side. On a simple reason, again, they wanted to stay because they don't want to steal, uh, they don't want to get involved in stealing. On a spiritual reason, they don't want to cross over because they don't want to be inv- involved in elevating the holy sparks. They didn't want to inv- elevate um, the, the, the sparks in the world, which obviously was not necessarily a great thing. So now comes Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe Rabbeinu is the leader of the Jewish people. And he gives a look. And he sees what Bnei God and Bnei Reuven are doing. And he tells them and he rebukes them. Why did he rebuke them? Because Moshe Rabbeinu saw that they didn't want to go into the land of Israel on a spiritual reason because they didn't want to elevate the sparks. So Moshe Rabbeinu rebukes them. But what's the point of him rebuking them? What, what's the way a leader really rebukes, re, re, rebukes Bnei God and Bnei Reuven? So he tells them like this. We all know that the job of a leader, and especially Moshe Rabbeinu, who is on a very, very high level, is to bring the level in the Sviro, the level of Das. And as we know, there's Chachma, which is wisdom, Bina, understanding, and then there's Das. Das is the ability to apply everything you're learning. Now, when Das is a central Sviro, so it's an important Sviro. Through Das, you can apply what you're learning. Because without Das, you can learn great and beautiful ideas, but you can't apply it. Das is the ability to apply it. So the job of Moshe Rabbeinu is to bring Das even into the level of someone that is in the level of Zerubahema, which as we mentioned before, the tribes where their source was Yud Yud Beis Bucker from Bia. So they were on the level of an animal from Bia. So Moshe Rabbeinu's job was to bring Das in there that they should not be afraid from dealing with the world. They should not be afraid of trying to elevate the sparks. As the Torah says clearly in reference to Moshe Rabbeinu, what does the Torah say? Moshe Rabbeinu's job was to give food to our animal soul. Now, how is Moshe Rabbeinu able to do that? Because we, as we know that Moshe Rabbeinu was from where? From the Oilam of Atzilut. Of Atzil, 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 he was actually called Neshama Dema. He was a very, very high level of a soul. He was a level of a soul of Atzilut. So because he was in such a high level, he was drawing down Das Elyon. Not Das of Biyah, but Das Elyon. Which is actually not only from Atzilut, according to Kabbalah, it was from Das Elyon, which is higher from Atzilut. And he was able to draw down that level of Das into the idea of Das of Bia. So therefore, since Moshe Rabbeinu was on such a high level, his job was to draw down Das of Atzilus. There's just like the way in Atzilus, what do we see? It's only Hashem. It's only the oneness of Hashem. So he draws down that level of Das into Bia. Or for example, as we mentioned before, Yud Beis Bakr Bia. And therefore, when, they're, when, when, you're, when you're involved in the world, you're able to not be distracted by it. How did Moshe Rabbeinu go ahead and do that? So therefore, Moshe Rabbeinu told them that in order for them to stay on that side of the Jordan, but you have to get the message and the mission that really life is not about staying on the other side and staying away from the world, but you have to engage in the world. So Moshe Rabbeinu inspired them by telling them, if you want to stay there, as a leader, I can't just let you stay there. I need to infuse you and inspire you to be willing to go on mysterious nefesh. Because when you go on mysterious nefesh, when you're willing to self-sacrifice for the Jewish people and for Judaism, then you will bring in within you the level of das vatsilos into your world, and then you won't be have, then you won't be afraid of engaging in the world, and you'll have the power and the ability to do that. And that's why Moshe Rabbeinu made a deal with them. He said, "If you want to stay there, no problem. What do you have to do? You have to cross the Jordan, and you have to fight. And actually, matter of fact, you have to fight in front of them. Once they conquer the land, and everyone is settled, and you've been infused with mysterious nefesh, then you will be able to go back onto the other side of the Jordan. Why is that?" 
Because the way it works is, Eretz Yisrael is the highest level. That's the highest level of spirituality. Eretz Canaan, before they conquered it, was lower. The other side of the Jordan is even lower. And then there's the whole world. Because they were going back to the other side of the Jordan, which is technically part of Eretz Yisrael, but nevertheless it's a lower level, they had to go through the Messiris Nefesh so that they can bring the level of Das of Atzillus into their lives. And based on this, the Rebbe explains beautifully the beginning of this week's Torah portion of Parshish Matthes. The beginning of Torah portion of Parshish Matthes says as follows, Vayidamber Moshe, Moshe Rabbeinu speaks, El Roshe, the head of Hamatois, of the tribes, and he tells them the laws of Ishki and Yidr Neder, the laws of making an oath, um, and how you make the oath, and how, God, if you make an oath that you want to take it away, that um, a Chacham, someone that's a wise person, could go ahead and take away the oath. Not only can you take it away, but you can take it away from begin with, that it's not even an oath to begin with. And the Torah says, Le'im or this is the word of Shiva Hashem. So the Rebbe explains, what is the whole idea that the Chacham, a Chacham has the power to take, to take away an oath? You made an oath. So if you made an oath, you're not going to do something. How can you go ahead and do it? Where does the Chacham have the power to do it on a spiritual level? The Rebbe explains like this. What is the idea of an oath? A nether. What's a de- nether? A nether, the dynamic, the mechanics of a nether is the things that are permissible, whatever it may be, food, drink, places, people that's permissible, and you make a nether. What means a nether? You're separating yourself from it. So nether is a, a vow of separation. Where does separation start in the world of the Sfirot? So we know the world of the Sfirot, when separation starts, if you start, we have 10 Sfirot, starting Keser, Chachma, Bina, Das, and the emotions. The, the world of separation starts in the Sfira of Bina. In the Sfira of Bina, that's where the, that's where the separation starts. Why is that? Because up until Bina, Keser, Taina, Grafzain, and Chachma, that is a humble Sphira. There's, there's no existence yet of anything, anything other than Hashem. However, when Bina starts, that's when Yeshu start. That's when the ego kicks in. So because that's when the ego kicks in, so that's why Bina is connected to the idea of a vow, and that's why you have to make a separation. So when do you need a separation? If you're connected to Hashem, there's no separation, you're connected to Hashem. But when you feel a disconnect, in Bina is where you start feeling the disconnect, you start feeling the, the yeshus, the arrogance, that's where you have to make a, a, a vow to separate yourself from it. However, when it comes to Chachma, we know, what does Chachma mean? The koyach, the, the power, the ability of Ma, to say what is it? What is, what, when someone's able to say what is it, that's a, that's a sign of humility. In other words, in Hebrew, it's called Chachma is the level of Bittul B'metziut, where you totally nullify it. So in other words, on the level of Chachma, where a person is totally humbled, there's no reason to make a vow. And the world is, doesn't, is, doesn't get in the way. When does the world get in the way we have to make a vow? Bina, in the level of Chachma, where it's totally bottle, you're not distracted, and you don't have to make a vow. So therefore, if you want to annul the vow, what does the Torah tell you? You have to go to a Chacham. Because on the level of Chachma, there is no vow to begin with. It's not like he has to make a vow, he has to figure out a way to break it. There is, he, he rips out the vow that there's no vow to begin with. Because on the, once you reach the level of Chachma, the level of Bittal, there's no separation. It's really all Hashem. And that's why it's interesting that the, in the Talmud, Yerushalmi, it says... That when Mashiach comes, or when a person's life is over, and they go through your life, and it's very interesting, uh, uh, Talmud, that you're going to have to give an accounting for everything that you saw that was kosher, food, every drink that you saw that was kosher, that you didn't stop, make a blessing, and eat it or drink it. Why? Because since there's a holy spark in there, we have a mandate to elevate the holy sparks. Now, why do we stay away from things? Because on the level of Bina, we're in a lower level, so we stay away from it. But if you're on the higher level, you, sh- you should only see the holy sparks and elevate it. You shouldn't be afraid to elevate it. So when Mashiach comes, or after 120, you're going to have to give an accounting why you missed that opportunity to elevate the holy spark. 
And based on this, the Rebbe explains beautifully, that's the, that's the, that's the way the verse goes. By Yedaber Moshe, Moshe Rabbeinu spoke, El Roshe Hamatois. So what is, what, is the, what is the spiritual understanding of the verse? Mata is a reference to our emotions. Mata, stick, power, emotions. Roshe is the head of the emotions. What's the head of the emotions? Bina. Because the emotions come from Bina. Moshe, Moshe represent, represent, represents Chachma. So the way it works is Moshe, who's Chachma, brings down into Bina the level of Chachma, which goes down into the Midot. And when you have the Avoida where Moshe comes from Chachma into Bina into the Midot, then you don't have to run away from the world. You can engage in the world. Why? Because even though you're engaging in the world, which is separated from Hashem, because Moshe is shining, shining within you, um, you're able to, you have the power to elevate the world. And that's why the Torah says further, Zehadavar. Why Zehadavar? Because we all know there's a difference in prophecy between Moshe Rabbeinu and all the other prophets. All the prophets, when they prophesied, they said, Koya, Koya Mar Hashem. This is what Hashem said. It wasn't clear. It wasn't exact. Moshe Rabbeinu said, Zeh. This is exactly what Hashem said. Why? Because Moshe has the clarity through Chachma to see exactly what Hashem said, what Hashem wants from us, and not to be afraid of the world. We can deal with the world in a way of Zeh. We can be clear, clear and we do not have to get, be afraid of being a, a distracted in the world. So in other words, like this, even though our source is from Yud Bey's Bakr de Biyah, and we can technically be distracted, but through Zeha Dover, if we connect to Moshe Rabbeinu, which is the clarity, we will have the power not to be distracted. And the Rebbe finishes off beautifully, and he says, we all know that Torah comes from the word of Hayra'a. Torah, which means to learn Torah, comes from the word of lesson. Everything in the time you learn Torah, you have to ask yourself, what lesson can I take away from this Torah teaching? And the, the Less than the Rebbe says you can take away is very, very simple. That we need to have both forms of service, just like the tribes of God and the tribe of Ruvain. One hand, we know they inherited the land we are on the other side of the Jordan. They inherited the land, it was the other side, they wanted peace and tranquility, that's great. But on the other hand, they were willing and they were ready and they actually went on a serious nefesh. So, in other, so you need to have both avoiders. The avoid of your own space, but mysterious nefesh for someone else. Or like the Rebbe says, the exact, the, the, like the difference between the avoids, which are more living in an intellectual world, and the shvatim that engage the world. Or to use another term that the Rebbe brings, a Kabbalistic term, the, you need to have both the avoid of Yehudei law and the avoid of Yehudei Tata, which I'll explain what they are. So there's, the goal in life is, we should be one with Hashem. Us and Hashem is one. Now there's two ways to approach it. There's one is Yichud Yehla, which means the only thing to begin with you see is Hashem. There's nothing that exists other than Hashem. Yichud means it's a oneness. Yehla, it's a high level of a oneness. What's Yichud Tata? That's a lower level of oneness. There's me, there's the world, but nevertheless, I cleave to Hashem. Two different avoiders. In the Zoyar, the Rebbe Brink says, so what's our avoid in this world? Yechudi ilah, we shouldn't be disconnected from the world, or we should be connected from the world and in the world to see Hashem. And the Zohar says clearly, our main avoid in this world is the avoid of Yechudi Tata, the avoid of connecting to Hashem within the world. We should be involved in the world and connect to Hashem, create the oneness within the world. However, the problem is we're too involved in the world, we can get distracted and it won't be complete. So in order to create the, the, the completion of Yehud Tata, you have to have the bittel, the humility of Yehud Allah, and that will keep you on high. Why? Because in Yehud Tata, you exist. You're one with Hashem. But when you exist, there's a yeshus there. So you need the humility of Yehud Allah, which blends together with the idea of Yehud Tata. And therefore, there brings a famous story that um, the people of Jericho, they wanted just Yehud Elah. They wanted just to be one with Hashem. So therefore, when they said Shema, how did they say Shema? They said, Shema Yisrael, Shema Shekeinu Hashem, Echad. Echad speaks out the oneness of Hashem. Straight from there, from the oneness of Hashem, they went into Vahafta. I love Hashem. No world. 
how do we say Shema? We say Shema, the oneness of Hashem, but then we say Baruch Shem Kvoid Malchusay Lailamod. We bring down the infinite light of Hashem into Malchusay, into the world, into Oilam, into the world. So, but the, but the people of Jericho didn't want to do it. They just wanted to live on the level of Yehud And it says the Chachamim were not happy with that because, yes, it's great that you want to have Yehud but you have to bring the powerful energy in this world, which we all know this is the same, the same idea between um, Yehuda and Yosef. Yosef was involved in the world. Yehuda represent, represented the tribes which were disconnected. And the goal is that Yehuda and Yosef should meet up. That we should have the high level Yehud the low level always meeting up. Now, where do we get the strength? Because it takes a lot of energy. On one hand, you're saying you should be involved in the world. On the other hand, you're saying you should have the humility. In other words, you want to have the inspiration that's really all one. On the other hand, we're dealing with the world. So where do we get the strength that we're able to fuse the two? That we see clearly from what the Torah says, Vayidamber Moshe. Moshe Rabbeinu, the Neshama Vatsilos, gives us the power and the ability that we can live in the world, we can interact in the world, but as we live and we interact in the world, we have to remember that really all our power comes from Hashem, and it's really all about creating the light of Hashem in a revealed way in this world, which is a blend and it's an art, but if we connect to Moshe Rabbeinu and Moshe of our generation, we will have the power and the ability to create that true, beautiful oneness in this world. Thanks so much for joining us to our Chassidus class, and we look forward to continuing to learn Chassidus, because Chassidus gives us the ability and opportunity to live in the world, but to be inspired with Hashem's infinite light in this world. Have a great and blessed week.